We're going to start it. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Um, good evening and welcome to Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. Today is going to be a very powerful and tremendous and powerful and tremendous and powerful, tremendous program. I have two distinguished gentlemen. One's my brother and one is my uncle. The topic of discussion is two men of God and two authors. Man, I can't fit those two together. I got Apostle Ivy Hawkins and Pastor Thurman Hawkins. Gentlemen, good evening and thank you for being a guest this evening. God bless hey. your family. We love you, man. Thank okay. you for having on, bro. No problem. So Thurman, we'll, we'll start with you for Pastor Thurman. Um, just talk about uh, your, your church ministries a little bit, as well as, um, as well as your occupation and what, some of the things that you do. Okay. Um, well, my church... Five, four, three, two, one. And, um, just talk about uh, your, your church ministries a little bit. As well as, uh, as so, someone can turn their thing down. Okay, there you go. Okay, go ahead, Thurman. <laughs> um, um, my church is located in, in Millsboro, Delaware. It's, the address is actually 31507 Oak Orchard Road, Unit 12 in Millsboro, Delaware. Um, we're working on our third year, in the you know, oh, okay. our called God's House of Deliverance Outreach Ministry. We're working on our third year. This year in September will be three years. Three wow. years that we have been doing the work of the Lord. Um, as far as my occupation, you know, first of all and foremost, I'm a man of God. I'm a pastor, but also, you know, to pay the bills. I work for a company called Purdue Farms, where I am in charge of security for the operations. I am the security operations manager, and I manage over 23 sites across the across the country that I make sure that there's security policies and and things of that nature and guarding. A contracts and things of that nature that uh, I do for the company. Um, a whole vast of things, man. Been there for 30 years. Wow. Uh, supposed to be one year, and then I was going to be a state trooper. And and the chief of wow. the chief of security said, "Man, you can make the same money without the risk." And um, you know, we worked on a a plan for me to manage that particular site, which ended up managing several other sites and ended up managing several other sites. So God's hand has been upon um, my life and um, started at Pilgrim's Ministry of Deliverance where I was mentored by my overseer who is on tonight, Apostle Ivory Hopkins, and also my pastor, this man of God that I love, Apostle Levin Bailey. Um, and I have a spiritual mother um, out of Redland, California. Uh, her name is Jackie Green. And because I believe that, you know, as a man of God, even though I'm a pastor, we should be allow men and women of God to speak into our lives, you know, to kind of direct us because we minister as pastors, we minister to other people, but we need ministry just like they do. So those three men and women of God, I, I let them, I mean, I honor them. They speak into my life, give me direction. I bounce stuff off of them, you know, as far as vision, because, you know, you put the years of ministry that they have, you're talking over 130 years of experience. So why not tap into that? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what we do, man. And, you know, and in the midst of this, um, you know, lately, last year during the pandemic, man, I had worked on my first book for 10 years, just putting it together. And then during the pandemic, it just dropped in my spirit and I just started writing. And, you know, we have written so far three books, two that have been published and one that is going to be published in set another one that's going to be in September with many more to come, man. And, you know, I just give God the glory because, I'm not a great writer. Uh, you know, I don't spell that well, but all of a sudden, man, when when the anointing drops on you, man, you have a story to tell of what God is doing in people's lives. And, and you want to see people who are battling with drug addiction and, and depression. You want to see them set free. And, and God has kind of given, given us the blueprint of how to go in and set people free, man. So I just can't wait. It's just a whole lot more to come. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll get into to, to the post a little later so we can elaborate a little more. Um, Foster Ivy Hopkins, man, um, you got the ministry. You're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, and I don't know what else you're on. <laughs> so go ahead and talk, talk about, your, about your ministry and what you do as a profession. Yeah, well, I am, I am a minister. I'm a, I am a minister. I'm not a pastor of a church. I'm an overseer of several okay. ministries across America. I've got connections all overseas. Uh, the Lord has really blessed us. They call us the general of deliverance. I've been in deliverance ministry for successfully for 41 years, I really bill myself as preaching balanced deliverance. Now, this is not like everyone else's teaching is not balanced. I'm not that arrogant, but I believe that we need to have the balance of the word in order to teach spiritual warfare and become more effective. 
I'm also a graduate of Queenstown College, uh, Queenstown, Queenstown Seminary out of Queenstown's Merlin. Amen. And um, we're also you know, East Coast Chancellor of Rafa Deliverance University, which is connected with Dr. Bishop Jackie Green from out of Redland, California. I, and I'm uh, overseer and founder of Pilgrim's Ministry of Deliverance. My chief son, Apostle Levin Bailey, is faithfully running the house. I mean, he's doing a fantastic job. And right now, uh, Omar, my life has really been catapulted into deliverance ministry, counseling, seminars, YouTubes. I'm getting ready to go do some work with iHeartRadio. And a couple of days, I'm getting to go on a show that will probably be in around 3 million people. So we are doing quite a bit of work in the Lord. Uh, Evelyn and I, my wife Evelyn is our, you know, she's my coordinator, my administrator. We are doing a lot of work and I've written 22 books uh, on, on, on different subjects, and man, broke up into different subjects, which we'll talk about later. I am excited, though, I say this much, about the book that Thurman got out, the one that talks about the process of deliverance. That their book was, that was the primo one to start with. I mean, that is, that's, that, that was, I call it, that's our baby. I remember in Philadelphia, him and I talked on that message, and he carried it to the bridge. And right. now it's becoming, it's written in, and Thurman, you can get that book on Amazon.com. It's a fantastic book. Uh, and I'll say this also, Omar, your grandmother, your grandmother prophesied to me when I was 17 years old that I would have a worldwide ministry. I looked at her like she had lost her prophetic mind, <laughs> but she was dead on target. And today, as we know, our grandmom is still living and she's strong, 92 years old, still kicking in the Lord. And to see that come to pass and see me re reaching nations, nations right. of family, it is such an honor. And to be here with you guys, you, you, you just don't know. Uh, Omar, I want to tell you, I appreciate you having me on your show. This means more to me than, than you will ever know to be able to sit here with y'all's generation, old school representing this side of the kingdom and the family. So we love you, man. And thank you for having us on. And uh, let's take this show for a good ride, OK? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I want to ask you, too, uh, I want to start on your pastor, uh, apostle leadership. Um, at, at what point in your lives did you decide that you want to be what society says, a man of God? You want to be a, a preacher, a, a reverend, a apostle, a, a bishop? Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Pastor Thurman, and also ask you, he says it's been three years since you've been having your church and ministry. Um, when, when, when you first got the key to, to, to that door to, to start your ministry, uh, what went through your mind uh, when you it was, it was final. It was finalized that, that you have your own church. And again, once again, I want to ask you, what 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 led you to want to be a, a pastor? Uh, Damn. Let, let, let me be honest with you. I did not want to be a pastor. Oh. <laughs> um, being an elder at Pilgrim's Ministry of Deliverance, I knew how everything was running. I was very comfortable. I, I loved the ministry. I had fell in love with God there. Everything that I knew about God, I learned there. And so I was comfortable. And then when that prophetic word came to me and saying that it was time to start a ministry, um, I kind of backed out of it and, and kind of went halfway. So I started what we call a parachurch, where I started a ministry within a ministry where I was doing conferences. But God just took the, I mean, it was like, Brother, the best word I can say is he took my sleep and my rest where I wasn't comfortable there anymore. And it wasn't exciting to me anymore. And it, nothing that the church had done, it just, it was just time for me to leave. And, and I just shared this, this, and this, this story today. I, I had to, I had to teach at a, at a church this morning. And I shared this story that when I went to Apostle Bailey that morning, I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have a building. I just had a name and just knew that God had called me mm -hmm. and made, the, you know, and told Apostle Bailey that I would be leaving in September. We didn't have a building. We didn't have equipment. And God supernaturally fulfilled that purpose with the building, with the, with the equipment. And when I got the keys, you know what the first thing that, that, that happened to me, Omar, was I was like, God, I don't want to fail. Right. You know, that fear of actually failing, because now you're on your own. When, when you're sitting in the ministry, you can, crit, you can critique, 
Uh, you can say, well, if I was the pastor, I, I, I would have did it this way. And now all of a sudden you're seeing the vision or the thing that, that we call vision out of a totally different lens. Um, and the lens is totally different than sitting in the church as, a, as, a, as an elder or sitting in the church as a, a choir leader. When you're looking out of the lens of leadership, especially when you don't, the road is not really clear, mm. it gets a little scary at times. And then all of a sudden, God will comfort you and let you know that he got you. So it, it wasn't like I called for it. It came searching me, man. Yeah, right. That's awesome. Amazing That's awesome. Thing, I want to I interject here. The mm -hmm. amazing thing, too, Omar, is that because of his love for God, number one, and his love for the ministry work and his uncle. Now, can you imagine sitting with your uncle and you're knowing, you're feeling that God is getting ready to have you to start a work. And you're thinking that some people may leave. Uh, you know, you don't really support your uncle's ministry. What's going to happen financially? I mean, I'm just keeping it real. Right, and right. I remember when he, would, when he would talk to me about it, I would tell him, I said, look, I said, if you do not go in the direction that God is sending you, you will both mess us up and yourself. The flow of life with everything, I'm going to say this to you, my, my family, the flow of life with every creative ability inside of you is, first of all, you get a fire in your belly, just like you did for, for the start Omar Showtime. It is a fire in your belly. It's like fire shut up in your bones. And if you don't let it take its course, you will be a miserable person that can't understand why you can't find yourself. Often what people are trying to find, called trying to find themselves, they actually will not allow the will and the do that God has put in them to come forth. I know as a senior leader that it was my place to help direct him to go forward, not get in the way of God. This young man, he might have been my nephew, but his soul, his calling, and his life belong to God. So I told him, Thurman, you got to go. And you know what? I said this in the earlier teaching I did. A couple of our people went with him. A couple of elders and ministers went with him. And they did exactly the right thing, exactly on the timing of God. And, and everything flourished and got blessed. But had he not done that, other lives that he's touched, God might have done it some other kind of way. But, you know, I'm kind of... I'm going to say this with you guys. I'm kind of, I've got a question with God. How does this thing really work? If Thurman or Ivory or, or Omar doesn't do what God puts in them, the lives that we're supposed to touch, do they get touched? Do we frustrate them? See, when you really get into this dimension, nephews, it's a dimension where it's bigger than you. When, when I was in, at my church at one time, and I say this uh, in a good way, there were people who didn't want me to travel. They didn't want me to become this. They didn't, they didn't want no general deliverance. They didn't want a preacher that was all over the world. But had I not done that, that none of them would be where they are in a sense. But Elder, Elder Thurman, you would have never been in your place if I hadn't stayed in my place. And so it's all, it's of the utmost importance that when God is developing something in your life. Let it come forth to the maximum. And if it, and let me tell you, when you know it's real good and real God, when it's too big for you, that's mm -hmm. a good sign. Oh yeah, if you can master it, if you can plan it out, if you if you know how to do it so well, oh that's where yeah, now when you stretch, when you stretch in this dimension, that's why you're really getting ready to end into that place. I said, call next. That's what Thurman did, and we wouldn't hold him back. But boy, he wrestled with leaving, didn't you? Oh yeah, <laughs> it, it was it was one of the hardest decisions um, that I that I have ever made um, because and and what it had to come down to was you know I had to love I had to love God more than I loved pilgrims, more than I loved my uncle, more than I loved Apostle Kelly because I had to walk in the will of God. And now, um, Omar, because I've walked in the will of God, mm -hmm. I have touched lives all over this nation. 
Um, there are people that were on drugs that came to our church that are set free. There are people that were having problems with their marriage. Their marriage is doing well. And, and it wasn't because, this is one thing that, that, I, that I've noticed, is the ones that you have, the, when, you're, when you are humble enough to realize that guess what, you can't do it on, on your own. Mm -hmm. It takes the work of God and the purpose of God in your life. I had to give up everything, Omar, and trust God about the call in my life. And trust that, you know what, God, I heard you. I believe you. I wasn't forced out. I'm doing it, God. I don't want to go, but I'm doing it because I want to be obedient to you. And this is the promise that I made to God, Omar, right. in this vision, that God, I will never allow anyone to come before you. Not my dad, not my mom, not my wife, not my children. God, I am. Does it mean that I forget about them? No. What I'm telling, what I'm saying is, Omar, that when you catch vision, when you catch the call of God concerning a, a, the call of God, whatever it is in your life, like Apostle said, there's a fire that you know that you got to protect. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain so they, and so they can run with it. So there's a vision that I have to write and be able to articulate and speak it to them that they can get it. And there's a confidence that you have to have in God to know that he has called you. And I learned to walk in that. And, and, and it wasn't an easy place. It isn't it, it, it was an easy place because now I gotta trust God for me. You know what I mean? For the vision that he paid, that he put in me. Yes, people are gonna question. Are you sure he's called to go out? I had family members that question that. But wow. you know within myself that God has called me. And then once I got out, and then they started seeing the fruits of what God was doing in your life, they don't have to question it. Like what we see here or what you're doing, we see the fruits of what you're doing. And when there's a call of God in your life, you will see the fruit. You will see the fruit, my brother. Yeah, thank you. So, so, so Apostle, I wanna, I wanna get to you in terms of, of, of at what point in your life did you decide that, that, that you wanna be a man of God per se? You know, the Lord brought me to that place when I was probably 19 years old. And it was actually a young lady that was working at a poultry plant like Thurman, the company mm -hmm. like Thurman works with. She started talking to me to, to me about the Lord. I had backslid. As, as I said, your, our grandmama took and told me at 17 years old that I had a grace like this. And I went about <laughs> from 17 to about 19 out doing my thing. I wasn't really trying to, I wasn't against the Lord. I wasn't really quite for it. I was just kind of living life. I was young, you know how it is. I didn't mean Jesus no harm, and I didn't want him to get in the way of the things I was doing either. But I'm going to tell you, the Lord had a rude awakening. This young lady, her name was Bertha Gibbs, Bertha Abinell. She witnessed to me so strong about the Lord that I came from becoming a drug dealer. I was a straight up drug dealer, Omar. That's what I did. I mean, there's some of the stuff I was doing, my, my mom and them didn't even know. I got to the point where I was trafficking chemicals and drugs and stuff interstate, and, wow. and God saved my soul. But that young lady witnessed to me, and God saved me. And he called me under the scripture of Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord God is upon you because he hath anointed you to preach the gospel, to mend the broken heart, the undo the heavy burden, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That was that verse that stirred me. And the very prophetic word that our grandmother gave me came to pass. Now, here goes the crazy thing. Right here, Omar, is a book I, that I wrote called Deliverance from Marriage Breaking Spirits. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this little book right here, I had preached a message when I was 21 years old. Me and Evelyn was married, about 23, we were married. I preached a message called Honeymoon Heartache and Headship, Deliverance from Marriage Breaking Spirits, from spiritual strongholds that attack marriages. This book was written from that. Now, remember, I told you about our grandmom's prophecy. The, a, a fellow called me out of California. His name was Rudy LeBlanc. I went to California. So anyway, he, I was so green at that time. He said, could you come and do a three-day conference for us? And I told him I would gladly come if I could save enough money to get there. The man looked at me and said, son, we're going to pay for you to come. Would you come and teach it? Now, why was that this message part really important and that one engagement? When he invited me out there, I ended up preaching 
in a place church that had Yugoslavian, it had Asian, it had different pop of the, of the nations in there. Right. I shared about my mother's vision at 17 that I would be preaching deliverance to people from every nation. And a lady sends a cassette tape. That's how far back it goes. She sang Amazing Grace to my mother in Thai language. She said, tell your mother that I thank God for the deliverance that I got through you. And it grew from there and what have you. And in 1983, my wife and I started Pilgrim's Ministry of Deliverance in Georgetown, Delaware. Awesome. But that, the, the, and we had to give up things, Omar. We, when we took and bought the ground for Pilgrim's Ministry, we, we had a house, we were living in a mobile home that wasn't exactly, it was breaking down. I'll put it to you, be nice about it, okay? Yeah. And we were getting ready to buy a piece of land. And at the same time, the land came up for the church. No one in our church had any way they could sign for anything, just me and Evelyn. And I remember telling her at a, at a business meeting, if we will allow us, Evelyn, we're gonna pray and see whether we're gonna get our house or get the church. I said, you go to bed, honey. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. You don't want your wife all upset because you done took and bought, bought and put. You know, you, you, got a, you got a house you get ready by, mm -hmm. and then you tell your wife, no, nah, we ain't getting a house, we're gonna get a church. I said, I'm gonna let this woman talk to God. That way I ain't got to fuss with the woman. Evelyn got up the next morning and said, the Lord told me that we need to get that church land. So she let the house go. We stayed in that trailer that had broke down issues. But today now we live well, God has blessed us, but we had to make that sacrifice. And that ministry in 1983, which is still alive today and going strong, Right. That ministry has caused many of you that are listening at me, such as our, our, our prophetess and, and, and Pastor Denise Slaughter. She's listening at us right now. You know, uh, uh, Apostle Jimmy Artis, uh, 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 Prophet uh, Jermaine Johnson and Roberta Johnson and Apostle Thomas Sturges. And, and I could name just one right after another, Bishop Gloria Johnson. All of these great ministries came out from the work that we were doing. Had we not obeyed, God, others' lives that became and helped thousands. It's all, it's about multiplication. It's not about moneyfication. It's not about moneyfication. It's talking about multiplication for the kingdom. That's what this is about now. Right, right, right. Okay, so that, that, that's about your, your experience of being, being an author. You say you have 22 books. Uh, the Thurman, you have two books in your, uh, Pastor Thurman, sorry, and you're working on your third. Um, what prompts you to to want to be authors? Um, and is your books based on religion or is it based on spirituality? Is it based on community? Is it based on family? Um, Apostle, you want to start? Well, as I said earlier about this first book that I wrote, it was on, it was on the family and what have you. Uh, Deliverance from Marriage Breaking Spirits. <coughs> and that little book <clears throat> caused me to do uh, several other. And the reason why I share these, because these were what I call the in-house ones. Because I even started a mom and pop publishing company. We published these in our own home. Oh, okay. And this one, and, and so these were the ones that I published in our own home. Well, you know, as time gets by, and I'll, I'll just say this real quick, because we're not advertising, we were just talking. I, we started out with deliverance from marriage breaking spirits, deliverance from damaged emotions, deliverance from spirits of sexual abuse, breaking the chain of rape and incest. And Omar, this particular book right here was the healing and deliverance of a pastor's daughter that had been raped and molested. And we prayed and saw God heal her from the spiritual and the emotional side. And then this one here, Angel of Light in Marriage, deals with how not to marry the wrong person and what have you. So we, those were the beginning of all of it. And then later on, we I mean, I'm not gonna go through all 22 books because right. it's quite a bit. But the first book I wrote, that one, Deliverance of Marriage, Breaking Spirits, let me tell you what happened with me. Now I'm always getting in trouble with your Aunt Evelyn. Okay. She had typed this like this was back in the day where there was no computers on anybody's desk. There was a little typewriter. She had typed out the manuscript for it. I said to myself, ain't nobody want to read nothing I'm writing. And I throw it in the trash. Evelyn walked over to that trash can, picked that book out of the trash, slammed it on the table. I said, this woman gonna snap me. 
<laughs> what God has put in you, the world needs to hear, and I'm not going to let you throw away your gift from God. And I just backed down. I went like, whoa, girl, okay, okay, sister. And lo and behold, 22 books later, we're still writing. Oh, that, that, that. Yeah. Well, you say, well, you say, Uncle, you, you say, uh, Aunt Evelyn, she, she, she's the boss, right? She's the boss. You know. <laughs> <laughs> she is the boss. You know, you know, every, every, sometimes in all of our lives, there are different people that are pertinent in certain areas. My wife is a, is a administrator. She has an anointing to administrate in the counseling that I do, as well as the writing the books, because some of my books are dealing with men's issues like the hurt man. Or right. uh, we got another book we read called Who Counsels the Counselor. That book is actually about after you have ministered to everyone else, who ministers to you. And that deals with crashing and burning and, the, you know, uh, 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 the things you go through with, with drug addiction and, and your life, that type of thing. But out of all of it, Evelyn had the ability to administrate uh, the finances and administrate even the building of our church. She's the one that designed it. I right. didn't design that. I'm running around preaching. Right, right. So, but yeah, but she was a, she's been and always have been a tremendous gift to us to this day, and and we're still. I mean, I wouldn't think like Thurman, man, sixty five years old, and my mind is still like creating and thinking. I have people that work for me uh, across America. Some people don't even know it. I have people working for me on different projects that I pay, and and I'm not paid by a church. I will tell you that right now, and that's not anything I'm boasting on. I'm just right. saying what God did. I have hard people that are paid to deal with trans driving. They deal with helping me organize computer stuff. That's what we do. I tap into the next generation that is more cutting edge in areas than I am. So this next book that we're getting out, I've got one we're dealing with deliverance and, and racism. We've, gonna, we've got that getting ready to come out and what have you. I'm also working on another book that deals with a lot more of inner healing and deliverance. So God is really, really blessing us. But let me turn it back over to you guys. Okay, uh, Pastor Thurman, you say you got two books. Um, <laughs> what made you want to be an author and a writer? <laughs> well, the first book, this first book, um, this um, Exposing the Spirit of Offense, this book here was inspired by events that happened at Pilgrims. We, I, we watched, we had a choir that was awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in deliverance, we know that the enemy tries to come in and any time that, that God is doing something really, really good, the enemy will try to come in and dismantle it. And what happened was we've seen something happen with our choir where they, they were winning awards and then all of a sudden they started dispersing. And I started praying about it. And the spirit of God shared with me that it was the spirit of offense that actually started to operate and start to break down that choir. And so this started dealing with, you know, offenses that were happening, things that people said, and we started documenting and writing. And like I told you, it took me 10 years to write this little book. And um, as we started writing it, man, it just revelation and understanding started coming in. And God started revealing to me how the enemy operates in breaking up um, relationships and families and things of that nature through offenses, which one of the terms for offenses means stumbling block. So he put stumbling blocks in a way. So what God inspired me to do was to write and expose what the enemy was doing, not only in the church, but he was doing it in corporate America. He was doing it in our homes. He was doing it on our jobs. And he wanted, he gave us a blueprint on how to expose what he was doing. Now, my second book, was a passion because the mantle of deliverance that rested that rests upon me. Um, I pray for people and I just believe God is 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 going to give them the breakthrough. But what I seen was that there were people that were coming in that were constantly coming in for prayer. And 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 as a deliverance worker, we're thinking something's wrong with them, or maybe you're not doing the job right or something because you're not going. And God shared with me, no, son, deliverance is a process. There are times that I will take my people through stages. In the Bible, he says, he told Israel that I will take your enemies out little by little. And it's the same thing with this. And my wife, Rosalind, and, and I wrote it in here in my, in my book that, um, you know, when I dedicated this book, 
I dedicated this book to my wife, Rosalind, because she was the one that really pushed me. She said, Thurman, you have to get this book out because it's going to help people. And I'm like, no, nah, Roz, I think this. She said, Thurman, write the book on deliverance as a process. And last year during the pandemic, man, God just, I mean, it was like he inspired, he just breathed on me. We just started writing. And this book not only touches families, but, you know, it touches communities. Um, it touches churches. I mean, it is full fledged in this, in the process because I wanted people to understand who are in church, who understand and, and want deliverance, that it just doesn't happen in one night, that there's a process of grief that you may go through. I was sharing with my brother, there are stages of grief that we, that I went through. When my sister died. I didn't understand it. I didn't even cry at her funeral. And then one day I'm sitting in there and I'm looking at her picture and I broke down and the burden and the grief that was on me and the hurt of missing her, it didn't just, I mean, just went away. It didn't that I didn't miss her, but the hurt went away. And I realized then that that was a part of the process of the way that God sets us free. And, 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 I, and when I wrote this book, I wrote it so people could understand the simplicity of how God works through setting you through through deliverance. And, and, right. and it's awesome, man. And, and, and Thurman, did you, did you, did you self-publish or, or, or did you get a uh, publish? No, no, I, I published through Amazon. Okay, got you. This okay. is Amazon. I, I had, I got a guy that edits for me. Um, okay. His name is Ron Short. He does, he, he did the cover for me. He did, the, he edited the book for me. He does a great job. You know, um, he's a good guy and he's saved. So, you know, there were things that, you know, because sometimes when you get edited and the editors get a hold of your book, they want to change things. Right. Um, and, and I wanted to make sure, you know, that when when he went in and started looking and started editing a little bit, hey, look, I, this is what I meant to say because I wanted, God gave me a clear cut what he wanted out. And, you know, we talk about very different topics in this book, you know, from lust and perversion to, you know, we, we talk about deliverance as a process. We talk about from identifying and confronting the spirit of fear and, and, and intimidation, you know, talk about breaking the chains of unforgiveness because people have to understand that if you've been raped, <laughs> you've been raped, that there is a process of deliverance that you go through. You know, I, I know this young man that was raped and he had a hard time with forgiving the person that raped him. He would stay up in the middle of the night getting high, thinking about how he could kill him. Then it got to a place where he could actually speak to him. That was a part of the process. Then the next phase was where he could actually talk to him and have a conversation. And then the next phase was where God would, he could even give the man that raped him a hug and pray for him. So that was stages of deliverance that we have to understand that God will take us through because deliverance is a process. You know, uh, br briefly, um, I want to talk about family because family is very important. Both of you gentlemen are family men, married, have children. Um, Apostle, you mentioned uh, Thurman and I's grandmother and your mother, Mama Dilly. She sets the tone in the family. Uh, about two, two years, two, three years ago, we had the family event where she celebrated her 90th birthday. She had 15 children, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, possibly great-great-great-children. Um, talk about what Mama Dilly means to the family and then just talk about you two gentlemen as being husbands, as being fathers, the significance of, of, of being a family man. Whoever wants to start, they can start off. Well, I, I would say this. My, my, my mom, had, had my mom had a powerful effect on my view of women. And as far as uh, between my mother and my sisters, they, they will never know. Sometimes I wish that I had told them years ago, Omar, what effect they had on me, because now Evelyn benefits from what I learned from my mother about how to treat a woman. Took a little while to grow up and get it, but I, I, watched, uh, I watched my mom work in that poultry plant, standing on cold, cold floors, I, but I watched her work, and that, that put a work ethics in me. I remember when I, I was raised in Maryland for a while, and when I came home to Delaware, uh, Everything wasn't given to us. We had to work. The work ethic I have today came from the way my mom raised me up. My, my mom did not help me buy a car. She helped me learn how to get up and work and buy it myself. I mean, I learned 
how to take care of a family from my mom because she she was there she she took care of the family i mean she was straight up there man and you know i think today evelyn and thermal i laugh at it sometimes but evelyn is a beneficiary of what my mom put inside me i was you know most of y'all who look at facebook see the cooking that i'm doing you know my mom and them put that cooking ethics in me so that that legacy you know in our family line on both sides of our family line even yours man of god even yours oh my both of our family lines our mothers had something that they deposited in our lives and that thing stuck with us the legacy of what it is in a generation you know i mean sitting here with you two right now to me this is the most amazing amazing thing we're representing i'm sitting here representing the the third the second generation of the matriarchal mom Dealey and uncle jc being the matriarch and the patriarch of the family and here where i am now the next generation and i sit here now with the third generation you guys watching god make y'all succeed put far in your belly to create so that's the blessing you know that we learned from our grandmother I cannot stress enough, sometimes with my grandchildren, all them, I hope they get it. I, and I believe they will. But to understand, it was a godly legacy that made us blessed. You know, young people talk about blowing up. I didn't blow up. No, I, I, I became a part of a generational legacy that got its roots in God. It was God. The Bible said it is the Lord that gives us the power to get wealth. The success that we have, Thurman, is God but it was a generational blessing. Somebody else struggled that we might get to where we are today. And here we sit, our grandmom's still alive, the matriarch, Uncle JC, the patriarch of the family, the, I call them the last two of the old ones. They're still here. And then our generation. Go ahead, Thurman, say something, brother, because I see you getting <laughs> off on me. Uh, no, um, with, 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 with mom Dilly, um um, she raised me. So I, I'm one of the grandkids. I mean, she raised a lot of us. I mean, every, she put her hand, mom Dilly put her hands on all of her grandkids. Um, she doesn't have any favorites. That, that's what I love about her. But it was something, Omar, that, that I watched as I stayed over there with her and how she made sure everybody was all right. But this is the one lesson that as long as I live, that I believe God used to, cause she, he knew that I loved my grandmother and I was out there doing some things and, and apostle came to my job and I did like every good drug deal. I lied to him, said, no, nah, I'm not doing, I'm not selling drugs, uh, apostle. So I, 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 I want to share this story with you because I want to see, I want you to see the impact that she has on our generation and on our family. Um, I was, at a place where I was doing stuff and I was like, man, I'm going to bless my grandmother. I'm going to give her a hundred dollars, right? Doesn't seem like a lot of money, but at that time it was the principle of letting my grandma know that I got you, right? And so I ride over there and I go to pass her. I said, mom, Dilly, here you go. And she stopped. And this is the words that she said to me, Omar. She said, boy, you know, I raised you up better than that. She would not take that hundred dollars because she knew it was drug money, right? Because she knew it was drug money. And she and what she said to me was, son, you watch me get up 4.30 every morning. This is what she was saying to me. Come on, say and it, do an earnest. You, you, you watch me raise 15 kids and several grandkids through doing an honest living. And I put the money back in my pocket. And I went home and cried. And it wasn't long after that, Omar, that I was saved because her influence on, a gener on the generations in our family, Mom Dilly has marked all of us. Yeah. There are things that, that she does that if someone gets in trouble, look, she makes the call and, and all of us, we're going to give up whatever Mom Dilly asks because she's strong on family right she just is downloaded in us you take care of your family we can talk about each other 
but nobody can't talk about us. That's the way she raised us. That's the way I seen it. I, I watched how she fed. All, every day somebody from the family is coming over eating and she's 92 years old and she, she may not do it every day, but there are days that she cooks and is still doing the same thing. And I honor this woman of God. And now that, that family orientated of taking care of the family to making sure that you are that we are good providers for our family. Mom Dilly inspired that in all of us. Uh, I gotta, I, I gotta share this, man. I, yes. I, I gotta share this. I never will forget it was, I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was a good while ago. Me and one of my other brothers, I'm not gonna name them on here, it's not important. We, I, we got offended with each other. Now we still loved each other, but we was offended. All of a sudden, I get a call from Mom Dilly, right? She said, I really need you to come over to the house. Well, I'm straight up, man. She called me. I'm on that. I'm on it. When I get to the house, I go, I go around the side of her and I get down and kneel down beside her chair. As I always do, we kneel down beside her chair. She said, you, and she named the other brother, end it now. Said, this is not happening in this family. She said, let it go and let it go now. I bowed my head. I said, yes, ma'am. Me and my brother got together. And I, you know what? Today, I don't remember what the heck it was all about. I don't really care. But when my mama said, it's done, she told us both. And look, when we came, when me and him came together, it wasn't like we looked at each other. Mom said, that's it. I, I, said, I said, I'm done, man. We, we slapped each other with our arms around each other. And we ain't said a word about that since. The other day, oh, mom, I was talking to a matriarch of a family. And she was telling me, she said, my daughter's birthday is coming up, but I don't want nothing to do with her. I don't want nothing to say to her. And the anger, the rage was so strong. And she said, why ain't the anointing of God moving in my life, young man? She said, I, I just want the spirit of God to bring peace. And I said to her, I said, man, I said, I said, you, I, and, she, and her daughter had tried to reach out. Her daughter had tried to apologize. And I remember what my mother taught me. It's almost like in the book of, of I think, Ecclesiastics, Limeo. He was learning what his mother had told him and the wisdom she had given him. I said, man, I said, vengeance is God's. I said, you are the matriarch. I said, don't you understand that if that bitterness and that unforgiveness is allowed to come from you, it will go into the next generation and it will go into your grandchildren. Omar. This stuff don't stop in one generation. Look, all of us know, and anybody listening to us, don't read us wrong. Our family ain't no different, better than nobody else's. We, we, we got issues. <laughs> uh, we got issues. But I'm going to tell you something. What my mother did when she told me and my other brother, shut it down now, she was stopping a generational stronghold, Omar. She was stopping a rift that could have been by like Cain and Abel. If somebody had a stop Cain and Abel, if somebody could have spoken Cain and Abel's life, I believe we wouldn't be where we are today. I believe that envy and jealousy that created murder and all of that in that family line, if it could have been shut down, it took the power of that matriarch to shut it down. By the way, let me give that, 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 uh, that old lady, let me give that precious mother kudos also. She broke down and she began to weep. And she said, she said, I asked God to help me. I said, ma'am, you're the matriarch. I said, if it can't start with you, I said, do you really think your grandchildren is going to watch you dissipate their mother like that? And they're going to blend right to you. She said, well, I want my grandchildren. I said, ma'am, you got to let it down. You got to ask the Holy Spirit. Now, I ain't telling nobody to go run out here and, and, and do anything. I'm trying to tell you the end game and the end goal is to save your soul. I'm just going to say that. But my, our mother taught us this, man. Right. I want to um, ask you, both of you two gentlemen uh, mentioned that, that you uh, out there selling drugs and did this, that, and the other. Um, and you overcame that. Um, when you let all that stuff go, did you feel free? Did you feel energized? Did, did, did you? <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'll pass Can I go first on this? Let me tell you this, um, brother. Jesus. Um, 
I, I, we and Apostle was talking, I think it was last week, and we were talking about wealth. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about, um, you know, where we came from and where we're at now. Um, Omar, when I, when, I, when I got delivered from selling drugs, um, I left money out on the table that I would never, didn't want to touch. They were trying to bring it back to me and I wouldn't take it. I went to a place, Omar, where I lacked because I lacked, but I understood, I understood that I had to give it, I had to show God that I loved him more than I loved the world. And in the midst of that, Omar, me doing that and being obedient and stepping away from it, there's a freedom in my mind. Do I still wrestle with it every now and again? Sure enough, do. Sure enough, do every now and again, those things, those, those habits come in as part of the process of deliverance. But the wealth that I have now that God has given me, it sustains you. Mm-hmm. And it's generational. <laughs> it's generational wealth because it comes from the kingdom. Mm-hmm. God is always about multiplication, man. And so when we gave that up, when I, when I decided that, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. For God, I'll live and for God, I'll die. And I'm going to trust God. I watched God. Watch this, Omar. When I went for a job, there was a boss that was hindering me from getting a job. God moved him out of the way. He got fired. And they had to do the interview process over again. And I ended up getting a job that led up to the job that I do now that led up to where God has allowed me, it gave, given me favor with, with a company and I make good money. But not only that, Omar, but because of what, how I sow into the kingdom of God, God is taking care of me. You cannot, there isn't a drug dealer out here can beat God's given man. And God will sustain you supernaturally and he moved the need for things. And I became the need for God. And when you have the need for God, God will not only supply your needs, but he'll also supply some of your wants. And and we're walking in that place now. And it's, it's, I'm talking about a freedom, a financial freedom that I can't, you can't even explain it. When God's favor is on you, that, and he releases his favor upon you, Omar, I can't explain it. I can't explain it, apostle. Omar, what you got sitting here, right, right in front of your eyes, is a third generational freedom and liberty from a stronghold that's in our bloodline. Mm-hmm. You see, the spiritual stronghold in our family started with bootlegging. Mm-hmm. In our early generation, our great, great, great grandfather was a bootlegger. And bootlegger transcended into drug dealing and drug selling. Thurman was a drug hustler. I was a drug consumer totally two different worlds. His deal was financial, hustle, bring it in. My deal was sell to consume. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. When the spirit of God broke that yoke in my life, I was rustling a generational stronghold. Somebody prayed for us that that alcoholism and the addiction would be broken and God was cracking it. Then it came to my generation and God was cracking it. When I went on that job and said to Thurman, well, just about the time God was getting ready to save him, I went to him and I said, nephew, your skirt is showing. That's exactly what I told him. Now on the street, he know right well that what I was saying to him is, whatever you're doing, and look, he he, he lied to me because he loved me. Because they had had mad respect for me. But he said, I can't believe Uncle Ivory know I'm selling dope like this. I said, your skirt is showing. I said, and God is telling me to tell you, you got to bring it in. And it wasn't many weeks later, God broke that yoke. Are we not still dealing with uh, uh, trying to break that stronghold in our bloodline? Yes. And Omar, I tell you this, I've had relapses, which caused me to not only obtain even greater grace from God, but also caused me to be able to write and bring healing to others who have gone through relapses. Oh, today, I'm good. I don't desire anything but Jesus and love for my wife, Evelyn. You hear me? I don't don't have a drug pull. I don't have a drug. I don't even like aspirin. I mean, (laughs) 
<laughs> Sir, man, I don't like nothing, man. But that, but I understand. But I understand the warfare of how a person can love the Lord and still have to deal with that addiction, trying to pull you back in. I know what it is to deal with a relapse. Follow me. Why? Yeah. Because I I was on a different, not any less bounded in Thurman, but my bondage once again was consumption. His bondage and stuff was hustling, totally different. And God had broke that thing. And, and, and some of the older ones in our family, I'm not putting everybody's business out. I'm just putting our business out, right, Thurman? But and we, we saw God break that thing. Mm -hmm. I seen him break it from, in our family line. And we got a generation now. They're going to they, they gonna do great things in God. I'm not giving up on one, uh, not one family member am I giving up on you. And you got nothing to be ashamed from. Your Uncle Ivory came out of that drug. Your Uncle Ivory has had relapses, and God has had to help pick me up. I've gone to counseling. I've gone to deliverance. And I don't you go to Jesus when the day I'm straight up free. But I haven't forgotten where I came from. Okay. I want to stay on the, the, the similar subjects. Both of you gentlemen are, 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 are men in leadership positions. And when one is in leadership positions, there are people who, you're younger than Michael School. It's just like, Every little mistake you, you do, so somebody's watching you 24 hours a day. And then, then there's temptation. Um, you, got, you got people who will, who will try to scan you with some money. You got women who will try to approach you. Um, I look at this thing that's going on with, with Kirk Franklin and his son. You know, now, now the whole world knows what's going on between him and his son. And there's another gentleman, this well-known gentleman who uh, is having an affair with his wife. So, wow, I mean, overcoming temptations, um, overcoming those this, this overcoming being under a microscope. I mean, you, you guys, when you're in a leadership position, um, I mean, it's one thing to be a leader, but people will just look for anything to, to tear you down. So <laughs> how do you guys stay strong in terms of, of, of being a leader? I, I, Thurman, you want to go first, soldier? Good. You can go first, Apostle. I, I will say this much to any leader. <clears throat> Omar, we preachers, have to preach a message of God's grace and truth to the point until we don't perpetrate something that not is that that isn't there. Here goes the truth about life. We give our life to Christ, and the Lord gives us the benefit to lead or have a blessed position, but that don't still mean everything is right with you. We got to face. Every man has to face his beast. Every single one of us got a beast inside of us. Could I, could I tonight go out and hit a corner and get high? Sure I could, but I choose to have integrity. Have I ever fallen and seen that happen? Absolutely. And I had to own it. I maintain to tell you that the leaders that you find, you run out on your wife, it came up because it was in you. Sometimes God allows what's in us to come up for us to deal with it. When you look at the people in the Bible, you look at Samson's life, powerful, wasn't it? Samson was a womanizer. Jonah had unforgiveness. He hated Nineveh so bad that he didn't even want to preach to them. Peter cut your ear off and cuss you out. But those were people that God chose. <laughs> in other words, I'm not talking about a license to sin, because let me help y'all. You don't need to give fallen nature license to be fallen nature. It's that already by itself. What a fallen leader must do is own his stuff or mm -hmm. own her stuff. And there is redemption. And is there a process? Yes, yes, sir. But to the Bible tells us he that is spiritual, when one falls, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. This position of a leader is strong. Omar, today, your uncle ministers to young women every single day with honor. Are you hearing me? Are we, I, I, I'm entrusted to touch lives all over the world. And it's because of what God's salvation has done to my life. But I have to have integrity. Like any counselor, when you hear the wounds and broken people, you're either gonna bring healing to it or you'll take and bring, bring damage to it. I choose to bring healing to the lives of the people I touch. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, integrity is something we have to guard. After a while, you do grow up. You get what I'm saying, but the young young man, 
Yeah, After a while, you do grow up that you can't, that getting high ain't going to do it. Chasing skirt ain't going to do it. Uh, hustle and flowing ain't going to do it because the Bible declares wealth got my deceit shall diminish. My God, and, I, and, it, and hopefully, and hopefully we'll get that understanding and we'll walk in the word like we're supposed to. But these ministers that have fallen, I pray to God they get up. I won't even do one show trying to show how bad or how terrible they are. Lest one day I find out, they find out how bad and terrible you can be when what your mistakes show up. Believe, believe you me, right. ain't none of us are arrived. We think we have. We gotta be very careful with our platforms not to forget you're human too. That's so right. when you see these things in people's lives, my prayer to God. Now, let's, let me say something about Kurt Franklin. Was it right the way he went off on his son? Probably not, not in the way that he brought it forth. Has anybody ever done that before? Yes. Oh, yeah. Has anybody got frustrated and, and either cussed, fuss, or laid somebody out and said, oh, God, I wish I hadn't done that. The only difference is nobody was taping you. I, I, right. Here's what I feel about Kurt Franklin. You and your boy work it out. You and your God work it out. And you've already owned it, so I'm done with it for Kurt. Sing. Do the work that you have to do. To his son, you and your daddy work on what y'all got because all families got problems, you know? And we're gonna, the thing is with social media, social media sometimes acts as if it can be so fake. It acts as if we're shocked to see humanity. Ain't a one of us looking at this show. Good. Yeah, y'all like that looking at me on Facebook and everything else. Ain't a one of you out there haven't had a time where somebody, where you haven't even got mad enough and said the wrong thing right. or spoke the wrong thing. I mean, we gotta, we just need to just keep it real. What happened with Kurt Franklin and his son, his son made him mad and he went off and it was not right and it was not the best way to say things, but it happens. And it's not only happened to Kirk Franklin, it has happened to me, and it'll happen to some of you. That is. That's right. That's right. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I say when it comes down to leadership, and, and, and we know that we're under a microscope, um, but there are things that we have to remember. Um, for me, and, and this is just, you know, for me, Thurman 101, God has me to my congregation to be transparent. So there are things in my congregation that I will share that I'm struggling with. Um, you know, that's how God keeps uses to keep me free. But there are certain things that I won't share with the congregation. You know, it's just between me and my God that we deal with. But I, what I think is sometimes outside of, you know, we tend to forget about the humanity of leadership, that they're not just leaders, but they're also human. They hurt, they feel bad. But there's a scripture in the Bible that, that, that kind of sums it up and it, it deals with David. And this goes like this, it says, everywhere that David went, he conducted himself wisely. And as leaders, um, we have to conduct ourselves wisely. Um, we, we can't put ourselves in positions and, and, and deal with things or, or approach things um, that we know that we're struggling with. Um, you, know, you know, you shouldn't be meeting with women by yourself. Um, you, 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 especially as a male and have a wife, um, you, you should be able to, to sit down and talk and share with your leadership um, some of the things that you're going through or some of the things that, that you're dealing with. And, and I think some of the times in this, that I see with leadership is that, you know, we have to put on this facade that we're okay. And sometimes we're not. Um, and I think that we need to really work on that. But um, as far as you know, dealing with stuff and people, you, you're just going to have to deal with, the people are going to say things about you. You're just going to have to trust God and believe God that God will get you through. And, you know, that's what I loved. I love what Kirk Franklin did. He, what I seen out of that, I seen humanity. Mm -hmm. I seen a man that loved his son, whose son who upset him. And the thing that Kirk struggles with when he gets angry came out. Mm -hmm. But yet he was man enough to come back and say, hey, look, I made a mistake. But also I seen, I looked in his eyes and I seen that the love that he had for his son. And, and what it showed me was as leaders, we're gonna make mistakes, but it's how we come back. I watched 
um, one of my leaders who's on this call today who fell, mm -hmm. but I watched him humble himself and was willing to submit to what he had set up to be restored. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think that if, if, if you do it the right way, the church can restore you and God can restore you, but you've got to be willing to, to be transparent at times. It's a hard thing to do in leadership at times because you don't want to be vulnerable. <laughs> I think that's the roughest thing is because as a leader, when you're opening up like this, you open yourself up and now you're vulnerable. They, they see your skirt is lifted up and they see your nakedness. And I think at times as a good leader, there are times that that, that, that will happen. And, and you just hope and pray that God comes in it and they'll be able to forgive you. If not, you got to trust God that God has forgiven you and move to a, a, what a word, a word that apostle says and get to a spiritual place called next. Omar, I, I want to share this for a sake because I think it's going to help somebody. What he was talking about several years ago, probably what, 12 years or more? That's I don't 12, know. 15 years it was good. I went through a, an emotional breakdown, had a drug relapse, and, set the, and had to set down. I told my eldership, I need to set down and not preach. I need to be healed. I told the pastors, it was a circle of pastors that I minister with. I remember weeping and telling them, I've had a drug relapse. I need to have deliverance, prayer of deliverance, and I need counseling. Thurman was on that board. When I told them, I said, y'all are going to have to set me down. I said, I am setting down. They looked at me and they were like, my, they, their hearts were broken. I said, I need to be healed. I had failed myself. I'd failed Aunt Evelyn, and I felt like I had failed God. I had a complete breakdown. And I told them, one of them, I'll never forget that meeting, Thurman, when one of them said, but when someone asks us what happens, what do we tell them? I said, tell them it happened. He said, but Brother Ivory, I said, tell them it happened. And I sat down. I even told them, now listen at this, Omar, that now, I, now mind you, I'm preaching all over the country. I shut down preaching completely. Wow. And I told that elder group, that elder group that I submit to, I said, I will not go out and preach again, even after counseling. And now when I say counseling, I went to a professional counselor. I sat down and had deliverance ministry, meaning prayer, casting demons out, taking authority over strongholds. And I went to a professional counselor. Are you understanding me? Mm -hmm. And I told them, I will not take an engagement until you guys see that I am well enough to get back on the road. And they looked at me and they said, what did you do that? I said, because when I founded this church, there is a bylaw in there that if the leader or anybody goes through any type of moral issue like that, if they're humble enough to try to get help, if they're humble enough to own their mistake, if they're humble enough to allow themselves to be corrected and healed, then let them go through the process. Let them take off from preaching for a while and get the help they need. That's exactly what your uncle did. Wow. That's now, 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 do you understand me? Now, I'm putting that out here. Now, the reason why I'm putting it out here, because few leaders will get on here and say that. Now, many of you look at me, the great, the general of deliverance, the apostle Hopkins, I crashed, fell, and burned, had a relapse, and sat down, and submitted myself to eldership, and submitted myself to counseling, and submitted myself to prayer. And today, I believe the reason why we are so strong and so blessed, because we were so weak and so submitted. Right. Did you, you get know, that? Right. You know, Apostle, you know, when people relapsed, it, it was time that they're, 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 they've, been, they've been contemplating on, on, on using something uh, maybe days or months prior to relapse. And so that's why it's good to be proactive and, and, and seek help and guidance, you know, prior to that relapse. And um, I'm quite sure that you, that you learned it uh, through, through, your, through your experience. Absolutely. I want to ask you two gentlemen, uh, 
the biggest situation that's going on in the country is this, is a, a possibly you mentioned this earlier racism. Uh, the, the Asian those in the Asian community have been be, being uh, physically attacked by, by others, um, and then you got the situation with the trial for the late George Floyd uh, in terms of police officer. So uh, there, there's a lot going on in, in regards to race relations in, in America. So as men of God, um, or words of uh, comfort, words of advice words of encouragement, any, any words that, that you two want to say in, in terms of the situation that's going on with, with the attack on the Asian community and then the racism, the racism that we as Black men get, um, <laughs> you know, when it comes to the police, unfortunately. Yes, yes. Well, well, for, for you know, I, I, I reach out and, and, and I, I really sympathize with what has happened to some of the Asian, com to the Asian community, those that have, you know, that have been murdered for no reason. Um, you know, our, our, our race has went through that for many years. Um, it's, still sad. Uh -huh. it's sad. Um, you know, we need to be praying. Um, there is something that has been ignited in our nation um, through our former president that has, that has been released and we're starting to see these things manifest. And I, I think it's more time to pray and go before God and pray for this nation that it can be healed. Um, I, I think we need to constantly speak to our young people and tell them, you know, um, that it's wrong. We shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't just point out a, a race and beat them up or kill them for nothing. God never intended us to do anything like that. Um, we, we have to share with them, you know, you know, racism is real. You know, I, I was talking to my, my granddaughter and, and sharing with her, you know, that, hey, look, if police pull you over, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And she answered, well, why, if I haven't done anything, it has nothing to do with whether you've done anything. It has something to do with our nation, how things have, how the system has been set up. And um, it's sad that we have to do that. And, you know, it's sad that we, you know, that, you know, the thing with Floyd, uh, yeah. and we have to go through this, he has to go, the family has to go through this trial. And I just hope and pray that, you know, that justice be served. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope and pray that if it isn't that, you know, that we, that that's that city that you know the riots that could possibly be happening if that if something goes wrong i think we need to be praying for that that the truth be be exposed in that in in that trial because we know for without a shadow of a doubt that what that police officer did was mm -hmm. murder absolutely um you know i mean a lot of people won't say it but you know we you've seen it and we need to to share you know with with, with our with our kids and with our this generation, man, that, you know, you can't do it. I mean, it's wrong, but man, we cannot go out and, and just riot for no reasons. It's, it's right to speak out, but to riot for no reason and tear people's businesses up for no reason is wrong. Um, you know, we need to share that with them, but we also need to share them the hope yeah. that, that, if we, that if we can keep believing God, that God can change it and give this generation hope that things can change, they have gotten better, but they also at times they've gotten worse. Um, but you know, there are times that we couldn't ride on the bus. Who thought that we would ever see a black president? Whoever thought that we would ever see a black woman vice president? So things ha have changed, but they also haven't changed. So we have to be praying for this nation that, that our laws balance out, you know, that we don't sentence young black men for double for for the same crime that white men do, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we gotta we gotta pray for the justice system, because the scales aren't balanced, <laughs> and we we definitely need prayer there. But um, I'm really concerned about this trial, and I hope justice does do the right thing. Now, you know, I was sharing with you earlier where I'm about to do something for iHeartRadio on a television show mm -hmm. that I'm going to be on. It's going to be talking about the spirit of racism and its effect on America as a nation. Some of the things that we're seeing today, those are the core things that was already at the foundation of our creation as a country. And I know that a lot, and one of the things I'm blessed that I'm, my, my wife is white, a man which I didn't marry because she was white, I married her because she was the white one for me. But here goes what I know as a truth is that some of the things that we are seeing right now it's things that our nation wouldn't deal with it in its very beginning, and it and it never got dealt with, and it's continuing on. You can get mad all you want to with different organizations, but the organizations and the people that are standing up 
calling certain things racially wrong, injustice. You can't get mad at them when they point their finger at an issue that is there. I think the hope for America is to actually own it and deal with it. I'm not, I know we're not asking anything from my white brothers and sisters. I'm not asking them for anything. I'm asking only that the justice system gives us all the same economic, political, and also living justice that we all deserve as a nation. You follow me what I'm saying? The Asian brothers and sisters should not be going. Now, why do I call them brothers and sisters? Because unlike, amen, those that think that uh, uh, only a percentage of people have the right to be valued as a human being. We are being created by God by one blood. All nations have been created by God. So I am, my heart goes out to anybody that's facing any level of racism, injustice and unfairness. But Omar, I say this to you, is that I believe that the hand of God is allowing the things that was buried deep to come to the surface so they will be dealt with. So it will be dealt with. And I believe that God is doing it. I mean, people prophesy about this. We in church, Thurman, we like to prophesy, you know, all these great things and good things. But you didn't hear the prophecy about this one, did you? We didn't hear the prophecy that was saying to America, America, what you have done and buried deep in your culture, it's one day going to rise up and some generation is going to deal with it. And I want to say this, the black kids, the white kids, the Asian kids, the, the Mexican, the Hispanic kids, the, the, the Indian kids, the, the kids from other races, they are rising up and confronting what many of us had to put up with. And you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad that they're facing it. I'm glad that they're looking at certain unfair issues that were overlooked, passed by. I'm glad there is a generation. And I'm going to tell you both this. I say this prophetically. It's not done. And I'm not talking about killing more people. It's not done until we finally find ourselves in a place of America and its government taking ownership of what it set this foundation in. And, and, that, and I'm saying this. And on an everyday basis, Omar, black folk, white folk, people treat me good. Ain't nobody bothers me. Right. I am extremely blessed, but that's not the life that every other black person lives. I've been pulled over by officers and they've said to me, oh, it's ivory. That's not what would happen to my son because they don't know my son like that. Right. I mean, you when you get to a certain level of notoriety, you don't get tickets the same way as everybody else. But if you're not careful, you will get a black ticket to let you know you is black. Right. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I just said it, okay? And look, I have white sons and daughters that are my sons in the gospel. I love them from the bottom of my heart. This ain't nothing against them. But Omar, we are facing Thurman. We are facing the generational curse of the foundation that our nation was raised upon, uh -huh. and it was racism. Yes. And, and that's what we're looking at. And it's going to keep rising up. And that beast is going to be conquered one issue at a time. It's going to be conquered, conquered one confrontation at a time. And I'm not talking about, when I use the term confrontation, I'm not talking about war or civil war, but there is going to be engagements where people, these young generation we got right now, there is a grace on them that says, no. I mean, it ain't all rebellion. It ain't all breaking windows. There are some of them that have been anointed by God to confront racism. Now, I know some evangelical friends of mine wouldn't want to say that. But you see, I don't, I, I'll say it. Hear this prophecy. If America doesn't repent for some of the things that it is doing to different races, it's going to keep having these type of things over and over. And it's not just because people are just sinning. It's because injustice calls out for itself to be challenged. And this generation, they're not rebellious. They're challenging something that should have been challenged a long time ago. And you're talking to a man that's interracially married. I've got, I've got white sisters and brothers-in-laws. None of them treat me bad. They couldn't treat me more royally. But injustice to Asians, Black, Latino, Mexicans, Indian, anybody is still wrong. Right. That's all we're asking for. 
for me. You know, uh, April marks um, the anniversary of me being a talk show host. I, I got two men of God on this evening. Um, and so I wanted to play this is something that I, I've never really done to my show. I've not owned the rights to this music, Facebook, and YouTube. So I want to play a little something, and I want to see your, your, your two gentlemen's reaction. It comes on. But um, that was, it, it, it was very powerful. Um, it was very powerful to have both of you gentlemen on, an uncle and a brother. Um, man, I mean, this this is the first time that, that, that I've done this. It's the first time that I've done this, so so this is a very a very uh, special show. Uh, let me see if I get this song ready. All uh, right, I think this is a song that uh, third third time you sang one day at your uh, I was watching you uh, it's, it's a sermon. So I'm gonna see if you guys feel feel the spirit. Good. Yeah. Sermon, I've had a good time tonight, my man. Yeah, me too. I can't hear it. Okay. Wow, that's great. Oh, man. Come okay, here it. No. no. Man, I was looking forward to this. What's the name of it? It was Every Praise. <laughs> yeah, oh, every yeah. Praise, huh? Every Praise. But anyway, you know, Omar, I do want to say this before we go. When you hear me talk so pointed about the spirit of racism that is in our country and what have you, I got hope that in Christ and through dealing, it ain't enough just to pray. You got to act as well. Right, you know, I, 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 you know, we, 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 we need, we need civil rights marches. We need activists. Yes, we do. And mm -hmm. I say, God bless, God, please bless those that are activists. Uh, even if you're the Indians, the Indians, God. Listen, we live in a world that if you don't speak up for yourself, your own, and everybody, you will be walked over. So right. it is a necessary, not a necessary evil, but a necessity of life. So my prayer to God is that. The issues that are dividing us as a country, the issues that are undealt with, the injustice, the unfairness in, in, in the, and the lack of equality in certain areas, I pray to God that these issues be faced, brought to the surface, and forced to be dealt with. Okay. I pray in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of God would raise up men and women of God in politics, in the church, and activists, that they would raise them up and they would stand strong on what they believe. But God, I don't support hate. I don't support destruction of property. I don't support a man separation, separating us as a people. I believe God has created one nation of all blood in the earth. And Lord God, I ask that you in Jesus' name, help us as a people, as a government, as a nation, and a world to pull down that beast. Because we know we are rustling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places that likes this system operating like this. We ask the Father to expose, to break those yokes and put them down. And Lord God, do it by all holy means necessary. By all holy, righteous means necessary. Holy Righteous means necessary. Amen. All right. Okay. So, Apostle, how can people contact you? What's your contact information? What? You can contact us on pilgrimsministry.org. That's pilgrimsministry.org, or just type Ivory Hopkins, and I come up everywhere in Google. We have Ivory Hopkins YouTube, ivoryhopkinsvimeo.com, and also pilgrimsministry.org. You can contact us there. Amen. And Facebook. We have several Facebook pages, Ivory Hopkins. Amen. Okay, Pastor Thurman, well, how can people contact you? You can go on. I have a website. It's called God's House of Deliverance, out, God's House of Deliverance org, or you can go on YouTube at God's House of Deliverance and you can pull up my sermons, or you can email us at ghod1010 at gmail. Okay, like uncle, like nephew. Okay, Pastor Thurman, you want to close this out with a prayer? <laughs> sure, sure. I, I wanted to... I wanted to pray for you and for this broadcast. Yeah, come on. Because man. I believe that the topics that you're having 
are cutting edge for, for this season and this hour. And, and, and I want to pray for the creativity that keeps stirring up in you and the favor. Because I, I believe that it's, this, this broadcast is bigger than Facebook. Uh, I, I believe that God wants you to, to go out and venture and there's going to be avenues and things that God is about to open for you mm -hmm. because you have the heart of the people. You have the heart of the community. And when you have the heart of the people and the heart of the community, you have the heart of God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this man of God, my brother, Lord God. Father, I pray, God, that you would bless him in the city, that you would bless him in the field. Father, that you would release favor upon him. God, that you would give him creative ideas, creative topics that would sharpen our community, that would speak to the needy, that would speak to those that are what our nation needs to hear, Lord God. Father, I want to thank you for this man of God. Cover him in the blood, precious blood of Jesus. Father, I pray that Psalms 91 would be upon him. I pray that the grace, the peace, and the love of God would be upon him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I love you, brother. Amen. amen. I love you as well. Love you, brother. Love you, uncle. Man, this is what an awesome you give me. All right, we got to do this again sometime in the future. <laughs> All right, man. All Anytime. Right. Okay, God bless. Have a safe week. All right, same to you, nephew. Love you, man. Love you, Papa. I love you too, guys. Bye.